and drugs on a map being sold. And um, every night I hear stories, I've heard stories of needles on Church Street, needles on Ellis Street, hundreds of them is with blood in them, just laying around on the sidewalk and in the gutters. So I think it's really important that the message gets out that one, we want safe, we want a safe place to inject. Two, we have, there is medical there. So if you do have a problem, you are safe. And three, uh, most importantly, you're right, it saves money. Because if you keep people out of the emergency room, it saves thousands of dollars to businesses and residents in the city. So you're right. And I, I wholeheartedly support it. I hope I mean, I wholeheartedly support it. Great, thank you so much for that comment. So, um, you mentioned um, that a person that goes into a safe injection place um, could be hooked up with uh, detox and stuff. Yeah. Where, uh, where are those bids coming from? And where, um, and can places like Tom Waddell, uh, uh, couldn't we focus on places like that that's already in Tenderloin and not the drug users union? Because that block, that 100 block, is really, really, really congested with a lot of different things already. And uh, if you can ask that by, and then you can save money by using existing places that are open, say like Glide and you know, in St. Anthony's and uh, the other place down here. Uh, the, uh, hospitality House. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Hospitality House. And, and it started like that. and uh, and. Another thing, I thought the foundation, the AIDS Foundation, was supposed to have people picking up needles. I, I used to pick up needles a lot when I did the people uh, figure room. And I know we have all types of different uh, 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 organizations sweeping and cleaning the streets already. But uh, what is the foundation doing since they are actually uh, supposed to be taking care of the boxes? And, uh, yeah, the, because I just don't want to hit my block. And I live on the 100 block of, uh, of, of, of Turk. Right. Okay, and I get it, I'm a very big harm reduction person. Sure. But it is just too congested with so much other stuff. So as you, the, the point would be that if somebody's going into one of these facilities, there's, there's not going to be any unsafe disposal because the syringes stay there. So that would but reduce yeah, the discard of syringes. Um, in terms of the locations of where they are, None of that's been decided yet. These are just ideas that for if we have them, we really want to have them where people are already using drugs. Uh, people are using drugs on a daily basis in a lot of spots in the Tenderloin. And we, just like when we had the, if you think about the pit stop program, and it had bathrooms for people who were publicly urinating and doing the bathroom in between parked cars in your doorway, it's not a pleasant situation. Once we had pit stop, those people had somewhere to go, because people didn't have anywhere to go, just like people who are injecting drugs, they're homeless injectors, they've got nowhere to go. So what you saw was a lot less fecal matter, as in poop, all over the tenderloin, and a lot less urine <coughs> all over the tenderloin, because the folks were using those facilities. This is what we believe, is, this is what will happen with a safe injection facility. People will go indoors, and the safety of having medical supervision, there won't be any deaths, there won't be any HIV transmission, there won't be any Hep C transmission, and people are eight times more likely to likely to be linked to treatment. So over, the, over, the treatment, there'll be a deal with the organisations that have the facility to allow people to have a fast pass in the treatment. But where is the money coming from for the extra detox bed? And um, and can't you just go ahead and you? Since the Tinderloin is so congested, right? And a lot of people are going to start saying, not on my block, please. So um, can't you use existing places like that are already harm reduction places? That's like what we just Tom? said. Oh, so so like, where's one the money of, coming from? Where is the, the, where's the money coming from for, for the detox bins? Because there's not supposed to be enough of um, on demand or whatever for, pro, uh, for a program. So where is that money coming from? That we just that we don't have any money for the safe injection facility yet. Either. These are ideas that are being shared with the community as these things become, you know, the move from the vision to the reality. But there'll be beds attached to whoever's using the facility because that's part of the whole program idea is to have access well, I to treatment. Myself, but okay, I, 
and I get what you're saying, and I totally understand, but I just, I just would like to know that the money is there for people that need to go, and go into a program, because a lot of people can't deal with harm reduction. They have to go the other way. Yeah, we, and those programs exist, so there's many uh, of them. Thank you, Paul. Sure. I was going to ask that the, the drugs that people would be bringing in to shoot in their arms, is it not all illegal? Yeah, it's illegal to possess and drugs. And if they purchase it outside, did they have to buy it illegally? It would be bought illegally, yeah. So that's a problem that I have with that. Mm -hmm. uh, next one is um, who puts the bill or cost of having these facilities in place? Since there's supervisory, there's nurses, there's doctors, there's lights, there's beds. Is a footprint that they have to fill up for the cleanup. That's that's that cost of itself. So yeah. who 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 now if the mayor says, yeah, let's go with this, undoubtedly the mayor and the city is that we're gonna do this. <laughs> but but eventually by and by, the taxpayers be put footing the bill yet again for yet another program. Um, and, and one more thing. Um, can I just answer that one? Oh, okay. so part of the study showed that you actually save money because when people do inject drugs on the streets and in unsafe conditions, overdoses, every time you call an ambulance, it's $4,000. People go into the hospital for wounds that they get from injecting on the streets because it's not sterile. That costs thousands of dollars. Your tax dollars pay for that right now. So we're saying we'll save you 3.5 million in tax dollars just on the HIV and the Hep C, not even counting ambulances, not counting soft tissue infections, not counting all the array of infections and things that happen to injectors that are, that are used in an unsafe and unsterile place. So just to be clear on that one, it saves money. And one more thing, please. And another thing, if they buy the illegal drugs outside, come inside, use it, What's the prevention to go outside buy more when the place is closed and use it out there? Yeah, well, the, the, you know. I just want to say, um, I'm going to put this out there. In Vancouver, we did a lot of work with Vancouver and study, and Vancouver has a site that has three levels. Okay, you have this, you come in, you can inject on the bottom floor, and you can, if you decide you want to stay for get detox from the second floor, you want to stay longer it's on the third floor. Okay, detox. it's all right there. They also have, you can, they also have a non-judgmental. Way. If you want to come in and you want to stay long term and you want to go down certain check and you want to come back the next day, they let you back in. They don't. There's not no limit. It's the problem we have right now is we have a limit on the detox and, 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 and the residential programs. And there's a way. This, there's no way in this there in this facility you can come in anytime you need it. And they're very supportive and they don't talk negatively to you. And you're very positive. They have less crime there. They have less less well, children yeah. less children using there. They're, they're they're more adapted to the situation. They have more understanding, and there's less people dying. Okay, um, I I'm, I'm I was a user. Okay, I I work with people that use in the street. I I walk down the street and I, I I literally take my coat off and cover them so people don't have to see. I feel that people should have a choice. Okay. And, and what they want to see and what they want to do with your body or whatever. That's whatever you decide, but there's a way of doing it. It's not what you do, it's how you do it, right? Okay, you want it to be very safe for everybody? You know, it's better to save money and be in a safe facility than to spend more money and it all be all over the street. I work with people, we go out and pick these needles up off the street. All you got to do is call us, we'll come get them. Okay, I'm a 24-hour exchange. I go out and pick them up, bring them in, and deliver to you. Anytime you want to call, I'll give you my number, you call me. You, you have needles on the street, call me. I'll come here. Well, I'll come here for you anytime, all right? You don't have to worry about that, okay? I'll leave you my number. It's no problem. It really isn't, okay? I don't, I work through the AIDS Foundation with Terry, okay? And, you know, but I'm not DPH, but I do volunteer and do this, okay? I do this on my own. Okay? So there's no downside in the way. No, it's, it's there's all over positive. Of it's all very positive. There's over a hundred of these in, in about nobody 65 died. cities. And nobody's died. No, and none of, none, none of the, no, the sky did not fall in any place that ever had one. It's like, you know, the, the, what people need to remember is that injections are already happening all around us, like in bathrooms, on the street, in between parked cars. The drug using is happening. This is a way of bringing it in, get, getting a semblance of control around it, helping people get back on their feet because there's going to be support systems built into the program. So that, that's, 
transformational. It can just the blades all of it transformational in characters, and we've helped a lot of people get any recovery and whatever. But this is they, they, if someone goes in there and they want recovery, we're going to have it available to them. If somebody goes in there and they just want somewhere to inject safe and keep using, that's fine. You know, so long as they're safe and they take it from the streets. And you know, nobody wants to inject in public. People don't want to be in between parked cars in a doorway. That's not what people want to be injecting. They don't have homes. They're using drugs. It's a substance use disorder. And this is a way of have taken it away from the criminal justice system and allowing people to be connected to the real services that they need is like social workers, case managers, nurses. So what do you think that after the drugs you know? So, so on the decentralized side, I, side, I don't, I don't agree with that mm -hmm. uh, because you're gonna have such a variance. Could of I defeat that? Oh, uh, second. You can put that on your feedback for well, us. Okay, well, okay. Sure. Here too. So we yep. on video. I'll take later. But the thing is, is that you have such a variance of different quality of service, like you actually experienced today. Um, with the, the different users, right? And um, and you'll you'll never really have a chance to, to look at it from a real true clinical perspective, where you can study it and you could really roll this out in, in, in a more significant fashion. Um, I'm really glad you said so. that because what we're proposing for the tender line and why we're collecting data today and why we asked you to write that down even though it's going to be on the video is that we're looking at this as a research project, just like Vancouver did. So well, we will be, it has to be a no matter project. which model we go with. So because because you haven't done it yet. Correct. Uh, yeah, but is, but there's also, sexual. there's other things on, um, in the community is that, you know, I, I would be kind of like wary of, of directing folks to something like this because um, one of the reasons why I started doing work in the Tenderloin is because, you know, every single time uh, veterans in this community, um, who many I work with on a daily basis, uh, right around the corner from here, are um, struggle with uh, uh, IV usage, and I've uh, been working with them for years. And we've set up just within our own community our own process to connect them directly to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I don't find any organization that has that capability now uh, for our veterans. And so another another thing that's like a uh, suggestion would be to actually have those uh, that service provider, Department of Veterans Affairs, there. Um, also manning uh, this particular um, center. Uh, we had like the three stair, three tiers where you have the service providers and folks there. So if you had the VA there, you get these vets in, and then now that takes a burden off of the local system, right? Because everyone wants to keep everything local because they aren't working with the federal agency, which could really help out. And then those, you know, the, the work that they would have to have for the healing would be taken care of out of a different like funding source. So we would even save more money to be able to help more people utilizing the local uh, um, services and the funds that we have. So that, that would be cool. And then so it would be interesting to like to, uh, for us, like it's Vets Alley, because you know we started this because no one was doing this with us six years ago. And we had to transition a lot of things on our own experiment, right? And um, and it would be interesting if we would be included uh, in this working group to kind of like give our feedback on what we've been doing and yeah. how we can even help. Absolutely. Is that cool? So that's that's what I want to yeah. thank you for your work with veterans. I want to thank you veterans and just say, yeah. you know, I work with a lot of veterans and 100,000 veterans got HIV from sharing yeah. syringes, mm -hmm. okay? So, and a lot of those veterans were left to die. You know, they, were, they got substandard treatment when they came back from Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, in terms of if a veteran was using and it, you know you don't want to get HIV and Hep C while he's using, so and then if he doesn't want to use, then we're going to link them to care. So well, we're doing that today. Right, that's so they're in the alley. And guy but, Jay. Well, there's a lot of people who go around, and a lot of people need and need their services. Yeah, but, but I'm saying is like we're already providing this type of thing. Oh, so yeah. then how do we like? Yeah, we need to. Work. Right. Okay, so yeah. I have to just the question. Do you email questions, questions or just one more question? Two sure. more right. items on the agenda. One more question, please. Okay. Uh, so, um, is, there, is there really a direct correlation uh, in the Vancouver area um, with uh, the increase of uh, drug selling in that neighborhood, in that particular neighborhood? Basically what you're saying is like, it's okay to do drugs here. Yeah. So, so you're working with drug users from other neighborhoods coming to, yeah. to this area. That's a good point. That's a good point. There you go. But that doesn't actually, the study shows that it's not hard. It did not happen. Crime reduced, drug dealing, drug selling reduced. Drug selling reduced. 
drug selling, drug selling, selling, and, and they have 10 years of data to, to show that. The other thing that they have and that we have locally is a study that says people who inject drugs aren't going to come more than like 20 minutes to another site. So they're not going to come from the hate, probably, or the vision, probably, or any place else. Perhaps they're going to come where they buy their drugs, where they do their drugs. Thank you for that question. Thank you for all your questions. Thanks for all your feedback. Please, we really appreciate um, it. Yeah, please go on the comment card. We want to collect those from you. If I, if I can ask you, do you want to have a business card? Yeah. Um, actually, the names are on the back of that brochure. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much. Dennis, I'll take care. Thank you very much. So the, uh, the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to ask Fernando for a second um, because he's got to leave. Uh, and all uh, uh, that's happening, there's a uh, food. Uh, so, so Dennis is going to help with the food in the back. So uh, we have food. So Fernando's going to do a presentation about uh, oh, okay. a presentation. Just a, a, a brief, brief announcement that um, there are board applications here. If you're interested in being directly involved with the Tenderloin Community Benefit District, there are open board seats. These are due by end of day Friday the 16th. I will leave these here. I will leave my business card on them too. I'll leave several in case anyone needs to, has any questions about it. I unfortunately have a baby that's sick at home that I must go or else my wife is going to kill me. <laughs> I'll never see me again. I have a survey for you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, actually, the next pr uh, presentation is from Fed Alley on the agenda. Uh, uh, Amos. 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 You're up. community, but we started off specifically focusing on veterans, and that's the crux of a lot of our work today. And um, so here's an example of when we first started off and what it was like when I had to walk through the alley. So uh, Shannon Street's official name of that alley. And it, I would have to, before I started painting in the morning, our first mural was in the alley for about maybe like six or seven months. I would have to like walk through for about 30 minutes and pick up needles myself and put them in a bucket and toss them out because I'm inviting all these other artists and folks to come out and um, paint uh, on, this wall, on these walls. So over the years and uh, being out there in the alley and then working with so many folks that are uh, unhoused uh, in the community specifically, uh, uh, IV users and developing relationships with them, uh, we over time um, started to implement uh, some informal ad hoc policies uh, amongst uh, how people would shoot up in veterans out um, and then where they would put you know, um, the needles and uh, particular individual community members who are IV users became sort of like you know leaders of you know keeping uh, the maintenance of the alley happened. And, and everything really flowed well until uh, maybe like last year, um, around this time, a little earlier last year, after we had the big Super Bowl push and uh, we started displacing so many homeless people uh, in our communities all around the city. Uh, I, the transit population, people drifting in and out of the alley, which is really not that heavy, um, really picked up. And then we ended up with a huge um, IV problem, IV needle problem. Uh, needles that were everywhere, um, discarded, um, just a whole lot of use. And it was really, it was, and then what it really came down to was um, I hadn't spent a lot of uh, time uh, during that time frame specifically working with uh, IV folks, uh, users in the alley. And uh, people just really didn't know the rules, right? They're just like, oh, cop up here, that's how we do it. And um, it was really just re-engaging with everyone there and starting to you know, you know, reinforce, okay, these are our rules, this is how we do it. 
And uh, recently, um, you know, we've seen the improvement. We're getting back. We have uh, uh, some different uh, cleanup crews, I guess, from Unions, Union Square and uh, the Tenderloin uh, uh, CBD uh, Business District. They come through the alley. Um, so those two groups.